They broke through, it's on. It's over! You better run, cops! They're getting into the Capitol tonight. They're getting in there. Our nation changed on January 6th, 2021. It's undeniable. Where do we go from here? That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm Jeff Eckert. I'm Jason Brewer. And this is The Thought Factory. The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, cultivating students through biblical discipleship and spiritual disciplines using theology, community, and technology. Learn more at neverthesame.org. It's 2021, Jason. Here we are. Happy New Year. Happy New Decade. Yeah, I guess it is a new I mean, decade. 2020 is like that transitional year, and we're all trying to forget it anyway, That's so we true. might as well start new with a new decade, new year, new millennium. Hey, that's cool. New millennium? No, not quite. New decade, though. Right. I just you just, just kept going. It escalated. <laughs> well, we're glad you're with us. This is our 10th season of the Thought Factory Podcast. We're so glad that you have taken your time to hang out with us. We are going to talk about everything swirling around us today. But as always, Jason, our perspective isn't just to make general statements, but what does this do to have an impact on us and the next generation and our relationship with students today? That's what we want to get into. We know there's a lot of people in our audience that work with students in some capacity, and we would just love to be a resource to you. We would love to speak into your leadership or speak into what you are doing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis with students, this next generation. And that's ultimately what we're doing here in the studio. We want to create topics and thoughts about what's going on around us, but how it affects students and how it affects your leadership of students and your ministry to students and talk about thoughts that may come to our mind that you may not have thought about before. So, Next episode is really going to be fun for me personally, and I know you're going to enjoy it because we're going to talk about youth ministry in the year 2030. So I recently was looking over some notes of a seminar that I did for youth workers in the year 2010, 10 years ago. What I did in that seminar was I took a look back to what youth ministry and youth culture was like in the year 2000. And then we talked about the present time when I gave that seminar, which was in 2010. And then we projected to the year 2020. I made some predictions in 2010 for what youth culture and ministry would look like in the year 2020. We're going to go over that. And then I'm going to make some new predictions for 2030 and even beyond. So we're going to look at what I talked about 10 years ago and see what you think. Do you think the same things about where we're at today and then what would your predictions be for 2030? Take what we're going to talk about and compare it to your own notes, and let's think about what the road looks like ahead. So that's in our next episode. Would your predictions include anything pertaining to fashion? Yes, they will, oh, okay. actually. Yeah. Ha- hairstyles? Uh, like what's hip and cool for a youth pastor yeah. to wear and, and style his or will, her hair? Will the goatees come back? Will the feathered hair for the ladies come back? We'll see. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, that's I'm already intrigued with what your predictions will be. So, so as always, we would love if you would subscribe to this podcast, but also maybe give us a good favorable review if you like what you hear. Also, we have a resource for you to download. And Jason, let's talk about that for a second. The trend report, I'm sure that's what you're talking about. It is. That is what we offer to anybody who goes to neverthesame.org slash trend report as a free gift from us to you for just simply listening. And it is a report on the adolescents in the church trend report that we do research on thousands of students across the country and their adult leaders and ask them a variety of questions and get their thoughts, get their responses. And we just 
analyze some of that stuff. We put it together in a 20 page downloadable PDF for you to look through and allow you to use that as maybe some resource in your ministry as you are leading other adults and it just gives you an insight to what the student is thinking, what they may be believing, and it may help you uh, in the long run for your ministry. All right, let's get into today's content. And one of the things that that strikes me, Jason, is how Scripture can speak to moments like we're in right now, where as this episode is released, we are inaugurating a new president, Joe Biden. This election season, and I've lived through many elections in my life, and you've lived through a lot too. I've had a few more under my belt yes, than yeah, you have. Yep. Based on math. Yes. And in all the election seasons that we've been in, without a doubt, this is the most memorable the most eventful, and we've seen a lot of things happen just within the last few days. We're recording this in between what happened on January 6th and the inauguration of a new president. And January 6th was a day that will be marked in our nation's history by uh, the debates and the discussions that were happening in the halls of Congress and then the breach of the Capitol building, as well as seeing over a million people gathered together. Now, we never get into political debates on this podcast. We're not going to do that today. But I, I want to point out, Jason, the fact that it's remarkable that over a million people were gathered together on that day that felt, for whatever reason, that it was important enough for them to be in Washington, D.C. One out of every 330 people in the United States felt it was important enough for them to be there physically present on the Capitol, to be there to make a statement about whatever that is. And we can't deny the fact that all the people there, that makes a pretty significant statement. And having a, a close, dear friend who lives in Washington, D.C., that and was able to observe some of it and knowing other people hearing I've I've heard two random people that I've seen in public places that within the last week that have told me I was there and I asked him I didn't even know these people um, they heard conversations that I was having about just the events of that day and they said hey I was there and they offered their perspective and opinion and these weren't like crazy radical people um, they were describing to me like what happened throughout their experience there until the Capitol situation was a very, for the most part, peaceful um, gathering. But I think we, we need to just remember that it was a significant day. And out of that day, Jason, we've seen lots of opinions and debates and discussions and it's unraveled a, a domino chain of events on the social media stratosphere and it's impacted lots of people but for me it brought me back to this very significant scripture that I believe speaks to this moment and that's in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 I'm just going to give you an overview of what happened. Jesus comes down from the mountain where he was transfigured. He had three of his closest disciples with him and when they were walking up to join the other disciples, there was a large crowd. And the teachers of the law were arguing with Jesus' 12 disciples. Uh, with the nine that were there, Jesus comes on to this argument with Peter, James, and John. So there's this debate, there's this argument happening. And a man in the crowd comes up to Jesus and says, Teacher, I brought my son who's been possessed by a spirit. And I brought him to your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't do it. And so Jesus says, bring me the boy. And when the boy is brought to Jesus, the boy immediately goes into a convulsion. And Jesus asks, you know, how long has this been happening? And he said, this has been happening to my son since he was a kid. And he says, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus responds and says, what do you mean if? And he says, everything is possible for him who believes. So immediately the boy's father says, I do believe and help me to overcome my unbelief. So Jesus rebukes the spirit. And then it says 
in verse 26, the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. Now, stopping there, we've talked about this, Jason. When you are at any kind of event or situation, you can get all the facts or you can get part of the facts. In certain terms, you can step out early and miss the end of the story. And I think that's what happened with some people here is they said, oh, Jesus came in and the boy shrieked, but now he's dead. I think the the timeline of facts is relevant in a lot of discussions. And what you said is some people show up late to the facts. Sometimes people leave early from the facts, but the window of time that people look, they're going to base their interpretation or their beliefs or their reaction to the facts. And so what you're referring to is those who may have stepped away from Jesus's healing early walked away with a mindset based on the fact that this boy was not healed. And we can definitely look at any situation and not know the facts and just simply interpret or our window of time is, is outside the realm of the full picture of facts. And we base it off of, of this small window. And so the point here, one of the points I think that can be made from this story in terms of how it relates to today is that, I believe we could look at everything happening around us and say, there's death, there's despair, there's loss, there's, um, you know, a time where the lights are turned out and there's no hope. Or we can look at what's happening now and say that maybe, maybe the, the crazy response, and I'm not talking, I'm not talking about, oh, Let's support or deny the protesters on any side. What I'm saying is all this craziness, I believe, Jason, personally, knowing the nature and character of God, he's always working for healing. He's always working for redemption. He's always doing something. And we can interpret all the craziness and the messiness and all the terrible things that have happened in not just on January 6th, but leading up to that, all the riots and the death and the, the anger and the rage that's coming out in people, perhaps this is a moment of healing where it looks like death, but life is about to occur. And, and that's our point here to start this discussion with you is let's take the long view. And the older I get, the more I say, I'm going to just stop and hold my judgment as long as I can until I can see things play out. And we have not seen things play out yet. And it's our human nature. We all do it. I do it. We, we want to jump to the answer and jump to conclusions. But I'll tell you, Jason, over the years for me, and a lot of people get impatient with me because they ask, you know, what do you think about everything? And I say, I don't know yet because we just don't know what is happening yet it's still unfolding let's watch and see what god's doing right now and it goes beyond what you are referring to as the protest the the capital riot all that stuff we're looking at a year even of 2020 of a lot of destruction or a lot of uh darkness or a lot of just emotional catalysts to situations where we are all getting squeezed even more and we are reacting through this year and so the timeline that we're even referring to it is not it's not just like oh from january 6th till now we're going to react to it it's we're we're looking at what is god doing in our lives in this country in the last year and what is what is that setting up toward because like you said, we are going through a healing process. The nature of God is life, to bring life out of death. And the healing process, sometimes it looks worse than what it actually is. The What the body goes through when it has to heal, it looks awful at times. You think of a bruise and how ugly it can look, but it's healing itself and it's going to uh, get better what we may be experiencing right now is the ugliness of the healing process. 
we're seeing the the poison so to speak being drawn to the surface and we're we're seeing that in people's actions attitudes thoughts behaviors responses that's one part and the other part that really stands out to me in the story that i think speaks to all of us right now is what was happening when jesus walked into this situation there was an argument i've never lived in a time in my lifetime and i've heard people much much older than me say this where there's so much uh, judgment opinions anxiety anger rage and a spirit of um, division and an argumentative attitude and tone from almost everyone i mean it's pervasive and it's sadly from what i would perceive not much different within christian communities and circles especially on social media where where we're just so divided amongst ourselves and jesus walks into a debate and an argument it's the teachers of the law and the disciples now i can only imagine but this is not in the black and white text but i'm just going to make what I think is an easy assumption here is that they were arguing about how this boy could be healed because we know from the scripture that the the boy's uh, father came to the disciples and said please heal him and then they couldn't do it so Jesus walks up on this argument and debate that's happening and I'm going to assume now I could be wrong but I'm going to assume that they were arguing about what to do with this boy and how he could be healed now, let's assume for a minute they were. Uh, they could have been arguing about something else, but the point I think I'm going to make here fits either scenario, whether they're arguing about what to do with the boy or just arguing in general. Jesus walks through and past the argument and above the argument, and he takes action. And if there's anything I would say as we start this discussion with you guys is forget the arguments. Sidewalk debates aren't going to change anybody's mind. Your political views, your strong opinions, my strong opinions, we shouldn't make it our goal to change people's minds. Now, you may disagree with that, but I can tell you from a from a, a lifetime of experience that you're not going to win these quote-unquote sidewalk debates, whether they're in person, literally on a sidewalk, which I've had many of those, or on a social media forum where you're going back and forth and you find yourself so worked up and distracted. And so what we want to do today is we want to... Can I can I interject real quick? Because uh, this is a little ironic because you just changed my mind on knowing that I won't change other people's minds in a <laughs> yeah. debate. So now my mind was just changed. Oh, by, wow. You've convinced me. So that's just a little irony because I was sitting here thinking I could change people's minds and then you just convinced me it's, by changing my mind that I can't change people's minds. And so what you are saying actually is the reversal of what you're talking about. It reminds me of Dumb and Dumber when um, he wants to get uh, Lloyd to bet and he bets <laughs> him that he can get him to bet and he takes him on. It's kind of like that, yeah, isn't it? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. A um, little Dumb and Dumber moment there. Um, but so what we want to do today is we want to talk about eight questions to ask. And these questions are all revolved around this idea. Is politics ruining your witness to students? So let's get into it. Number one, are you more captivated by the headlines than you are scripture? Yeah, asking the question of, do you find yourself more enthralled in headlines or what the political pundits may be saying, regardless of what news outlet you're listening to or who you follow on social media? There's a lot of voices that carry a lot of weight in our minds and our thoughts. Are you listening more to them than what the Bible says? What is being said in the truth of the scripture? What God has already proven to be true and said and withstands the test of time and circumstances? Are you looking toward those truths or are you trying to find truth in what what is being said politically or I, on your favorite platform that you find yourself going to to find maybe what people are saying in regards to this topic because i i find that that people are basing decisions more on their political values and they may not realize this but they're looking we have become so politicized now that decisions how we uh, operate what we say have now been more about politics values than biblical 
values. And yes, there is some of the gray area where you go, this is a biblical value, but it has bled into the political realm and we allow our biblical value to argue the political value and it can it can cause us to ruin our witness with with students because we've swung so hard into the political realm yeah yeah great great point second question to consider is this are you more passionate about politics than you are faith so if students were to look at your social media feed if they were listening to your conversations if they were to hear what gets you motivated and when we say passion a lot of times that doesn't necessarily even mean a very positive thing it could just stir up this passion that might get us really intensely angry or frustrated or anxious and so i think it's a great poignant question for us to consider is are we more passionate about politics and faith and i'm just going to say the overwhelming majority of our listening audience here you listening you're you're on some kind of social media platform. I mean, statistics would say this. There's very few of you that, that aren't. I'm just going to say, for those of you that are, if we were to go back and track your social media posts, your comments, and for those of you that maybe aren't posters but that you're readers, I'm going to get to you too, and you say, well, I don't post about politics, but the things that you read, the things that you're drawn to, the, the posts that are political that you are reading and you are diving into the comments. What is that saying about where your time and attention is going? Because if you're more passionate about politics, I think it has an overall effect on, um, on who you are as a person. And on that note, in 1801, there was a British pastor named Andrew Fuller who was kind of perplexed by this idea that... Um, what happens to people that draws their passion away from faith and Christ and the gospel? And he wrote a book about it. And again, this is going way back to 1801. This guy's in Britain. But he said um, he explored the causes behind a person who, in his words, once appeared to be zealous, affectionate, and devoted to God, but who had now lost that former zeal. And according to Andrew Fuller, one of the main culprits, now keep in mind this is 1801, one of the main culprits of what caused a person to fall away from being zealous and affectionate and devoted to God was an eager, and this is a quote, an eager and deep interest in political disputes. So what Andrew Fuller was able to discern in 1801 was one of the main factors of a person that pulled them away from being zealous and affectionate towards God was a deep interest in political disputes. And Jason, I'm going to make an observation here. Of the people that I know, like me, of you, yep. and others, oh, okay. people that are more involved in the political debates and discussions and, and discussions and issues are overall less zealous and affectionate and loving towards God. Which, and then, in return, if you're less zealous about the love and affection towards God, you are less loving and affectionate towards his people. Yes, yes. So you may think that you are being helpful by entering the political realm, but what you're saying is it they're zealous for politics and not God is causing them to not be as loving and affectionate towards God's people, which we are called to do, is to love our neighbor. Yeah. So one of the questions I've been asking is, how much can you be involved in the political discussions and debates and still keep your love and passion for God burning hot? Now, I think it's possible, but I'm just telling you, I don't know that many people that have that. Now, I know lots of people in uh, government and politics, particularly in Washington, D.C. And some of these people I know really well and some of them I don't. But I would say this, every single one of them, and I can tell you from my experiences of being in Washington, D.C. on a regular basis for different things, faith-oriented events, National Day of Prayer, etc., that Washington, D.C. is a dirty place. It's, you feel it. 
when I go there, I feel I feel the pull of the power. I feel the magnetism of influence that's there when you're in rooms where powerful people, people in the highest levels of government that I've been in rooms with. And I will tell you that I feel it, but I feel the dirtiness. And every single person I've talked to that's been involved in politics from an elected office perspective have told me the same thing. They've said there's a certain level of engagement that that they feel like they that just comes with the territory they can't avoid that that it feels like it's like tainting their their personalities their souls everything about them and i think that's just the nature of what it is and i think as as leaders with students we have to ask ourselves the question are we more passionate about politics than we are faith and we may want our voices heard and we always are making a decision of what we say and post and everything that we may present online. It's a decision. It's not like it just happens. You're not just like, oh, whoops, I just accidentally uh, typed that out while I was sleeping. It's, it's a decision that is intentional to present a belief or a thought. Do we take the time, the, the added three seconds or 10 seconds to go, is this, is this helpful? in the overall conversation is this uplifting to this person uh is this honoring god in my reaction is this what i want to to look like to represent uh, a christ follower and but sometimes we just get so caught up with the emotion that we we almost disregard any of that and just go ah you know i'm letting my voice be heard and i've had to remind myself over and over and over during the last few months of this election that even though it does matter who's in office, it does matter who our leaders are and laws are important and people who lead who they are matters. I will say this. I've had to remind myself, Jason, that, that my allegiance and what I believe really is the true source of change in this world being faith and, and God himself changing people's hearts and the good news of the gospel that supersedes any person in office by far all the way throughout the scriptures I mean, you look through and, and God talks about through the prophets in the Old Testament I was reading in Isaiah the other day that he raised he listened by name I raised up this leader to do this and I raised up this leader. and most of those were not really good people when we get so wrapped up in into who our leaders are and believing that that ultimately is the litmus test for where society will go. I think we're missing, as believers here, we're missing the plot. We're losing the plot because we're, we're saying, well, we, we got to have this person. We got to have this party. We got to. And that could not be further from the truth. Um, that what we need is to remember that God is sovereign and he's leading it all. And what brings about true change in God's government is people's hearts changing. That's what matters. Number three question to consider is, are you addicted to conflict? No. <laughs> yes, you are. No, I'm not. I this, this really hit me the week of the election. This hit me square in the eyes because, Jason, what I found myself doing, and I'm just going to be vulnerable here, is I found myself going into political posts, whether they be on social media from people I know, or into articles written about the elections that was coming up, and going into the debate and comment section, and finding, and this is, this is where I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, why are you enjoying reading this? Why are you enjoying watching the fireworks here? Why are you enjoying watching these bombs go off in people's comments, and, and how they're snarky with each other and making you know, terrible accusations towards other people. And I, and I'll be vulnerable here. And it's, it's hard to admit, but I found myself taking pleasure in reading it and seeing the conflict in the Holy Spirit. I felt like really convicted me and said, why are you enjoying the conflict? At first, when you hear, are you addicted to conflict? You may think, well, I don't, I don't enjoy just going up and starting a fight with somebody on the street or in person. Uh, just having that conflict like that's what can come to mind when you think well I like to 
in person have a, a more peaceful relationship. But your point of going to the comment section where we are drawn and we seem to just continuously scroll and read and go, oh, good point. Ooh, that, yeah, that stings. Oh, oh, yeah, yep. And you find yourself addicted to what people are saying and how they're conflicting. And that makes more sense because we, we want to be on the winning side. Right. We want it to have the point that is superior to every other point out there. We want to have the final say. We want to win. And when we start to scroll and we may be bent one way or the other and we see things that confirm our bent, we're like, yeah. And then we see the other side and we're like, that's not true. Or yeah. that's that's not the way it is. Or And that battle that happens in the the cesspool of the internet you know it just yeah. yeah why are we there we want to see our perspective win in those conversations even if we're not in them and and that's for me you know i, I have really strict guidelines and we do here in our team about the things that we you know post online because we we um we just want to live differently not just in pers our personal interactions but in what we're saying publicly on things like social media but I would say if you're listening to this and you if you could if you could be honest with yourself right now in this moment and say do I get just kind of a little bit maybe too much enjoyment out of the conflict that I see do I find myself saying to um, friends or family members hey did you see what so-and-so said and did you see this other person's response or whatever especially when it's personal on social media and it's people that we know and we might say, wow, I'm really surprised by what this person said. Did you see that? And can you believe they said that? And you start to go down that road. I think those are signs maybe that we're addicted to the conflict. Which leads to, do you love debate? That's the next question. Do you love debate too much? You are willing to enter into that fight and willing to have your your talking points or your point of view. And it's not bad to have these things, to have a point of view, to have things that just appear wrong to you because of the other side. But when we are seeking to debate somebody and we're immediately like willing to enter into that, that comment section because somebody says something, what's drawn you to make a rebuttal to that comment or make a comment to that article? What's drawn you in? You know, I, I think of sometimes that I, I feel that urge of like, I need to I need to make a comment here, but I just three seconds later I'm like, nah. Yeah. So Tim Keller in his book Counterfeit Gods says this about idolatry. He says that he defines an idol as anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, and anything you seek to give you what only God can give. That's such a great definition of idolatry and what an idol is. Something that, that's capturing our attention, it's absorbing our heart and our imagination, and it's something that we're trying to get something from that only God can ultimately supply. And when we get into these debates, when we be, we, I think it draws our hearts into believing that political outcomes, who's leading, will really fulfill our needs. You know, Jason, I think that politics to me, human politics, is seeing outside external solutions for internal issues. And what I mean by that is we're talking a lot about race today and the racial uh, injustice that's happening. And there's no question it's happening. It's real. But what's going to change that? Are laws ultimately going to erase racism no now should we have laws that are, are you know that make it um fair for everyone of course we should of course we need to have those laws and we should be fighting for those but if we believe that laws are the solution we're falling so far short because laws do not change people's hearts if there's one thing we can take away from the law in the old testament is that law does not change people's hearts. And God himself says, I want to write the laws on people's hearts. I want 
my word and my values to be inscribed not on tablets of stone that Moses brings down from the mount. I want them to be written and inscribed on the hearts and souls of people. And that's what we're searching for. So we don't ignore the sin. We don't ignore the injustice, but we have to say, what is the ultimate solution? So Jason, that question, do you love debate? Is debate something that we go to that gives us this certain kind of pleasure that we think is going to make a difference. And Jason, I, I just want to say too, and I say this all the time to people in conversations, and you and I have talked about it, talked about with our team here at Never the Same, is words are cheap. The world is full of talkers, and, and it's so empty of people that are doers. And Jesus himself said in Matthew 9, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Jesus walked I just imagine him in Mark 9 walking right in the middle of that argument and debate and going right to the to the Father and saying, forget that stuff. Like, if you think, if you're listening to this and you think that you're making a difference by simply expressing your opinions online, I'm going to say something really strong. You're wrong. Because that's not going to do anything to change the world. Your actions will change the world. Of course our words matter. But if you can alleviate something in your heart, maybe a sense of guilt, about an issue by saying, well, I made my statement online, that's all, then you're falling so far short of making a difference. I also think of John 1.14 in describing Jesus, how he was full of grace and truth. And this comes to mind when, when I think of debate because we want to debate the truth. We want to say what is true, what's the interpretation of the facts, what are the facts, what are... What are the outcomes of this decision or that decision? And we want to not only be considered, be truthful and fight for justice and, and what's true, but, but I think when we go online and try to fight for truth, we eliminate the grace aspect of that equation of representing Jesus because we, we can get so caught up in this is true that we come across as a jerk. And I don't think that when Jesus spoke the truth, he was a jerk. I just don't think, I think he had the grace in what he was saying, but that was also the grace to kind of forgive your inadequacies or your inability to know the entire picture. Uh, but we've eliminated the grace aspect of the equation because we are so ready to put somebody else down or so ready to uh, demoralize that point of view. Yes. So we've hit those four questions. Are you more captivated by the headlines in scripture? Are you more passionate about politics and faith? Are you addicted to conflict? And do you love debate too much? Jason, we're going to come back and talk about four more questions to ask whether or not politics are ruining our witness with students. Let's get into the next four, Jason. These are four questions to be asking. Next question is this, do you see a person or their politics? That's a good question to ask because we tend to categorize people in what they believe. And if their belief is different than our belief, we write them off. And it's so easy to write people off, and especially nowadays. It's like you believe something different or you ascribe to this category of politics I can eliminate you as a friend yeah. or you hear stories of family members denouncing family members because they believe differently and we've accepted it. It's just part of our life now. And, and so it's that question. If you are able to write somebody off so easily, you're probably answering it a little bit more like you only see them as a political view than a person. So that's, it's one of those things where if if you happen to maybe find out, if people are super secretive about it, and you were to find out that a friend of yours voted in a way that you didn't vote, let's say for president, maybe they voted left and you voted right or the opposite, and all of a sudden now you look at them and you think, wow, I can't believe they voted for that person. How could you be so deceived? Yes, right? 
And and so that that's where it is. It's like, do we see their them in the political group category, or do we see them as a person first? And Jason, what I found is that the world is very peaceful if you turn off the noise of the world and interact with people individually and in personal settings, you know, one on one, whether it's in person or an interaction that's that's you know just personal in nature as opposed to like publicly interacting with people where you watch the news and you see something or you go online you hear somebody else's opinion and maybe you know them or don't know them and you can't you know you maybe try to interpret some things in a post or a comment um you know we were talking about recently uh, i made a comment about hey let's focus on the gospel and i had people picking that apart and going well what do you mean and what's the gospel and so i'm not gonna you know, get into these debates on my social media feed. I'm just going to, you know, say something that's positive, uplifting, you know, and God-focused as best I can. But yet people, you know, are wanting to look at it more through politics. And I'm just not, I want to look and interact with people. And that's what I mean. Nowadays, it seems so much easier because there is this uh, proximity that we distance ourselves and so the screen is an easy thing to distance yourself from yeah. somebody else and not even know and by simply writing them off it, you don't have to interact with them online or you know whatever but if you were to say that to that person at the grocery store and have that same debate like i don't think the same things would be coming out i don't think the vitriol would be coming out as what you are posting online in a comment section. Um, I even, Absolutely. even the, the audio that we listened to at the beginning of this episode, while we were watching that recording, the, the comments that we came up with was he's saying these things because he's further away from the actual situation. He is so far away from what's happening in front of him. He's able to be a little bit more bold in what he's saying. Yeah. But if he was two feet away from the police officers, no way would he be saying the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's where, again, if we look at the example of Jesus, Jesus looked past the political signs. So, you know, back back in that day, we see it all the time, and, and we love to we love to look at the Pharisees and teachers of the law as the bad guys. That's an easy one. And Jesus is the good guy. Of course that's the way it is, but when you look at it and, and the characteristic of Jesus was he was able to go in and interact with anybody. And a case in point remember my dad saying this uh, when I was growing up in a sermon, and I'd never heard anybody talk about this. But in his group of 12 apostles, think about this, Jason, he pulled in a zealot, which in our terms today would be a, a total right winger, probably easily would have been a person um, riding on the Capitol on January 6th. And then he had a tax collector. In our day today, you know, total progressive, total liberal, total sellout. In his group of 12, he was able to attract these two people that would probably rip each other's throats apart outside the presence of Jesus. But something about Jesus was appealing to everyone. And what I would say is, if you can't see beyond someone's political yard sign, so to speak, if you can't love and appreciate and interact with them in a peaceful way, and I think there's a problem. I think you're letting politics ruin your witness as a gospel to the world. Well, even when he is interacting with the sinners, how much more compassion he has by simply being face to face versus you can look at the Pharisees who weren't interacting and how that distance caused them to be much more critical of those that were, quote unquote, on the other side of the belief spectrum. Yeah. So next question, are you more pessimistic or optimistic about the world? So are you more pessimistic or are you more optimistic? When you look at the world, I think if we look at it through the lens of a glass. Yeah, then what? And then we are like, hey, I'm thirsty. <laughs> well, there's only half water in here. Yeah. The, I, I always think about it. I remember... Uh, he's no longer alive. He's um, 
really an icon of the past in terms of like motivational speaker, but Zig Ziglar said every day he woke up and he read the Bible and he read the paper to hear from both sides. And I think that's true that what we see in the news is, and any kind of, any kind of media that we're consuming, whether it's, you know, watching a screen of some kind and, and watching a video of a story or, um, you know, reading something about current events, it's generally through a lens of bad news. And then you pick up uh, the scriptures and you start thinking about faith and who God is, and that's the good news. And that's literally what the word gospel means is good news. So you got bad news and you got good news. And I think that one of the questions we need to think about is, what's our view of the world? Is it pessimistic or optimistic? And then why? Why are we thinking that way? And I would say, Jason, for me, when I tend... It's, it's kind of a, it's a litmus test for me. When I find myself getting pessimistic and negative about the world, I think I'm consuming too much of the bad news and I'm letting that sink into my soul rather than the good news. It's a really good point. The fact that when we find ourselves being more pessimistic, is that of God? Is that what God is trying to communicate to us in this situation? And, and are we resonating with that pessimistic worldly view or is there a hope based where God is not done? God yeah. still has more to do and he's at work and he's in control and we place our faith in him or we place our faith in whatever else that we could place our faith in. Like you mentioned, the counterfeit God of our lives. Yeah. And the human constructs that we've developed to help us get through this world and you know, some of you might be sitting there, and I and I know there's cynics listening, and they're going, "Yeah, you're being naive. You you have to, you can't just ignore." So if you're optimistic, I think a lot of people think, "Well, if you're optimistic, that automatically equates to you're ignoring and you're burying your head in the sand to all the injustice and all the wrongs." And no, you're not, because you know, just like what you said, Jason, is that God is not done. That God is relentless. That when you know the character of God from the scriptures, you know that God is never done. If there's evil happening in the world, that's not the final say. And it doesn't have to be the final word. And if you're following Jesus, you're following a Savior, a Messiah, a teacher who is always relentlessly never giving up and pursuing the souls of every single person in this world. And so if you say, well, the world is just going to hell and that's all there is to it. I just don't see how you can believe in the gospel where Jesus in Matthew 16 says, on this rock, on the truth of who I am, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not. He makes a definitive statement there, will not prevail. The gates of hell will not overcome the good news of this gospel that, that's built upon me and what I can do to save a person's soul. So if you find yourself more and more pessimistic, not naive, um, and ignoring you know the injustice by being optimistic, but if you find yourself thinking it's over, it's done, there's no recovery, then I just don't believe you're following the gospel that we find in Scripture. I think even in leadership, when you are faced with obstacles, the greater leaders are able to look at that obstacle and see opportunity. And I think... In this situation, when we see things are really bad, what have we mentioned around the office and in our meetings and stuff like that? There is greater opportunity for the gospel to resonate in the hearts of mankind because it seems like there is more of a dire situation, but we can be so focused on that or we could say there is opportunity in what God can do in this situation. Question seven, are you dividing or uniting people? And as we think about that question, what role are we playing? Are we playing a role to divide people or to unite people? Now, what I would say is people generally, again, I've found very few people that are super entrenched in justice issues and justice movements that work to unite people. And I know I'm stereotyping and categorizing people, but what I love to find 
And there, to me, at least I've interacted with very few, but I love to find people that are passionate about justice that can unite people for it and towards it. And I think all of us care about justice. That's why we get so worked up. That's why we get so passionate and engaged is because every single person, there's something within all of us that God wired for justice. But how do we go about, do we go about in a very divisive way? So the post that you may have written or you may have read or the things that you've seen when it comes to justice and passion, are they done in a way to unite people towards a common cause or are they to divide people you know it and you know what's sad is what attracts attention what attracts news what attracts passion is when our political leaders speak in divisive ways and that speaks to our human heart and our human condition you know what trump was the master at that he spoke in such divisive ways and he's not the only one both sides for sure people from all over the spectrum of politics, but when you speak in a way that's divisive, uh, that's not the ways of God, it, to be divisive for divisive sake. Now, of course, we have to point out things, but I think we have to ask ourselves, like, what role are we playing in the world? Are we dividing people or are we uniting them? My perspective is a little bit different. It's, um, I ask this question, are you bringing life or are you bringing death? In this situation is your words bringing life to this person or is it bringing death to that person is there a portion of you trying to kill the emotions of the other person or are you trying to bring up their spirit and it doesn't mean you have to agree with that person I think that is what's hard is when we disagree we think that that's bringing death you have your own opinions you have your own beliefs you have the the right to to think these things, but how we interact, it goes back to the, the grace and truth. Like when we are interacting with somebody else, are we talking in a way that is still bringing life to them, even if we disagree, or is our way and our method bringing death and hoping that we just stab them enough times to bring death more than what they are stabbing us with? That's right. And the last question is would you rather let people know that you're right or that they are loved? In our interactions with people, would we rather them to know our opinion, that we believe our opinion is right, or that they are loved by us? What's more important to us? And I will tell you, Jason, that that's where the Lord's really been working on me, is I would rather people know that they're loved. And whatever they might believe, you know, you mentioned earlier in a sarcastic way, and that's what all, ever, all of us have said, oh, they just don't know, they're deceived. And we have, we can have such a condescending perspective on people because we go, well, they just don't know. But I'm so glad that Jesus didn't do that with us. And he still doesn't today. And how God views us is that he doesn't condemn us for our lack of understanding. But he still loves us regardless. He wants us to know that we're loved more than he wants us to know that he is right. And you know, as we get to know the Lord more, we realize when it comes to everything, he's right, we're wrong. But that's not of first importance to him. His first importance is, I want people to know that they're loved by me. I would say that wraps up a lot of what we're even trying to say, is we want to be right. We want our voices to be heard. We want our opinions to matter. And we want to stand on the side of, of history and be right regardless and that that goes with any justice aspect that goes with any belief that will ultimately affect how we live out our lives in this country and and god's kingdom is different we are not building our own kingdoms we are not to try to rise up the rung of righteousness and trying to be right in any circumstance and try to demote people that are wrong and and ultimately at the end of the day be more right than anybody else in God's kingdom it's it's love are we spreading the kingdom of God through our our words that we say that are filled with love are we spreading God's kingdom and good news with the actions and how we treat them and how we view them because 
the heart of man is can be deceived and we could present a really loving a reaction to somebody and then turn away and and curse them out and god <laughs> would look at that situation and say your heart's not right and he wants our hearts to be right with him and when they are that love is an outpour of what's in our heart i know you had something really interesting jason happened to you recently that that's so um meaningful to this conversation let me go through the eight uh questions to ask and then uh, i want to hear your heart on that number one are you more captivated by the headlines in scripture two are you more passionate about politics and faith three are you addicted to conflict four do you love debate too much five do you see a person or their politics number six are you more pessimistic or optimistic about the world Seven, are you dividing your nine people? And eight, would you rather let people know that you're right or that they're loved? So my father-in-law came and visited and he was complaining about what is happening in this country in reaction to the election, to the Capitol riot, to just the divisiveness of our country. And he is obviously older than my wife and I and has experienced a lot more in this country and seen a lot of things and he just had these worries about the direction and the future of America and the negative thoughts about the division and regardless of political party Democrat Republican he was just we're American and yet this just was baffling to him and he was complaining and my wife's like just turn off the news just turn off the news and he said he couldn't get away from it and the the conversations that he was having with his friends and discussing recent events it just worked him up and every conversation was working him himself up and and at this point my youngest child my daughter Selah, who is uh, just turned two uh, walked over to him with the indescribable devotional and basically climbed up into his lap and asked him to read this devotional and he randomly opened it up and started reading it out loud. And the first thing he read was, Lord, you know everything about me. Every thought that I think. Help me capture any bad thoughts that wander in and fill my mind with thoughts of you instead. And so at this point, he's kind of laughing like, all right, did you, did you send her to me to, to speak about this topic and, and kind of going, you set her up for this, right? And no, no. So he turns the page and the next thing he reads, Lord, when I start to worry about all the things happening in my life and around me, help me remember you are Lord of all and you hold everything, including me, together. And at this point, you just realize the, how God can speak through so many things, especially a child, a two-year-old. And just how cool it is that God has that ability. That no, we did not as parents set him up by sending her over to climb into his lap. And no, uh, we did not hand her the book in, in hopes that something like this would happen. She picked it up, walked over, climbed into his lap and wanted him to read the truth about God. And in that situation, it's, it's so remarkable of how God speaks. And when we forget and we start to look towards other things, when we start to look at who's in office, when we start to look at who's in power, and we allow the things of this world to start to creep in, it's just a, a simple reminder that God is in control. He is the Lord of our lives and he cares about us so much that he's not done with us. And I don't want to go into the story of, of his timeline of life and how God has worked on his life immensely, but he's not done. And in that moment, he just spoke to my father-in-law and said, all right, I just want to remind you of these things, that I am Lord. 
The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, whose vision is to see new generations transformed in Christ to further the kingdom of God. Learn more at neverthesame.org.